News Talk 1340 KROC AM. It's 10.08 on the Tracy McRae Show. And the usual suspects are here. <laughs> Tom Ostrom and Andy Brownell. Good morning. morning, gentlemen. Morning. And I'd like to introduce our special guest today that, you know, I'm even getting a little choked up even before we get started, Walter. <laughs> Walter Halloran is here. Um, and I am very glad that you decided to join us today. I know that this was not easy for you. I kind of I twisted your arm a little bit. I hope that... I hope that you enjoy your visit here today. I'll, I don't even know if I'll ask you at the end of our conversation if you liked it or not. Well, I hope so, too. <laughs> I really don't know why I'm here. I guess I <laughs> fell victim to your charm. <laughs> Tom couldn't believe that that could be the case, but oh, here you go. <laughs> go figure. Well, um, Walter certainly did not contact me, and uh, I just had someone who is a friend of yours that... Maybe at this point you're not considering him a friend, but sent me a two-page letter about you, Walter, and about everything that you did and your career in the military and what your part of D-Day was. And um, there's a part of this letter on the second page that is in bold print, italicized and underlined that has said, he has asked me not to contact the media about this. However, I cannot let this opportunity pass. So thank you to Jim, who sent your name. I called and kind of twisted your wife's arm a little bit, too, and I said, if there's anything you can do to make sure Walter calls me back, I would really appreciate it. My first port of call after this will go and visit Jim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <And> <laughs> James, <laughs> we have something to discuss. Yeah, I'll hmm. let you deal with that. Well, um, I, let's just talk about 60 years ago today, two days before D-Day. Do you remember what you were doing 60 years ago today? Not specifically, but I, I'm sure I'm be fairly accurate. Uh, we, are, of course, were in England preparing sure. to uh, board our ships and go over there. We had been briefed uh, the night before uh, by uh, some officers that had presented sand tables that depicted the beaches that we were going to land on. They were phenomenal works of art. They were a- absolutely excellent. And each one of us had a very good visual representation of precisely where it was that we were supposed to land. And the other thing I noticed about it while we were waiting to go was that the the food that we had was fantastic, <laughs> sort of like the Last Supper. Uh-huh. They had eggs, fried eggs, if you can imagine that, and mm-hmm. real milk and steak. Uh, most of us were just absolutely thunderstruck at this last meal that mm-hmm. we were being prepared. It sounds like a meal from uh, you'd have on the home in Chatfield. Something <laughs> like that, that's right. So how does a boy from Chatfield wind up being a photographer? Because that's what you did. You were a photographer to take the photos of the soldiers landing at the beach. So just if you can tell me, how did you walk through that whole area, that timeline? <laughs> uh, I was working out in Hollywood, California as a young teenager, uh, apprentice photographer. And when the uh, war commenced, the War Department decided that they were going to have to enhance and increase tremendously the photographic capability of the Army. They had to document everything that was about to happen for future uh, generations to see. They were going to have to uh, create a cadre of people to produce training films. Anybody that's been in the service has seen far more training films they would like to see. So to do this, they they had to, of course, go out and recruit what was called talent. And uh, in due time, some officers from the War Department came to Hollywood and uh, met with a spokesman from the industry, a young fellow named Ronald Reagan, who was Hmm. their point man in Hollywood. They announced in the various trade journals that interviews would be held at Hollywood and Vine, as I recall. And those of us who felt so disposed uh, presented ourselves down there for an interview. And if you were accepted, and just about everybody was, I suspect, you were uh, brought into the Army, of course, and then immediately sent to schools. I was sent to a school at uh, Paramount Studios. And after completion of that course of instruction, we went to uh, Samuel Golden Studios. And I might add that the Paramount Studio experience was really delightful because it was not classrooms, it was all on-the-job training by the masters that were cinematographers in the business. And at that time, the road series, far, far before you came along, Tracy, <laughs> uh, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, and Dorothy Lamour, with all of those road series to Zanzibar and so forth, they were there shooting, as well as Abbott and Costello. They were popular at that hmm. time. And I remember Luke Costello was extraordinarily uh, kind to uh, we who were trying to learn something. He would come up and say, well, why don't you put your camera here? Let's take a look over at this side, and if I walk here, and so forth and so on. So that was how we got That's into That's how you get to the beach at Normandy. By way of 
San Antonio, Texas. California. So you mentioned to us earlier off air that you had the thir- uh, three decades in the military. So that wasn't a plan, obviously. You were planning to have a career in Hollywood at, before the this opportunity came along. Three decades would probably suggest that by this point in time I'm old, <laughs> which is a true case. But no, I, of course, had no intentions whatsoever remaining in the military service. I don't think few people did, except those that went to the military academies. They pretty much sure. predetermined that this is what they're going to do. Okay, so you did that training. They got you to the beaches. How d- And you had to be there, obviously, before the soldiers came in on those Higgins boats, so how did they get you there? Did they did you parachute in and just take up a camp on the beach and hope that the Germans didn't notice you? you know, or Tracy, how how did they find you there? I wanted to ask them that too because <laughs> I know the Coast Guard ran those landing crafts over so the Navy, and I know the Coast Guard were combat photographers yeah. too. So on June sixth, as, as Tracy is saying, at midnight roughly, where were you? Yeah, to how to get to shore? Were you on a landing craft, or did they drop you in? No, no, we were on a landing craft, and then X number of miles offshore, I've long ago forgotten, and we went over the side in the rope nets into the small Higgins boats, mm-hmm. and we went in, and we went in with the, to answer your question, Tracy, with the combat engineers. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a group of people who really uh, precede the infantry. They're the ones that have to go in and blow all of the obstacles that are on the beach. So if you're going to photograph the infantry arriving, you go in with the combat engineers. I think that uh, when you were here earlier in the week, and we were kind of trying to sweet-talk you into coming in today, uh, we were talking about the life expectancy of a photographer, and I said, well, the only thing that I know about D-Day and about World War II mostly is from Saving Private Ryan. And... I know that the photographers did not fare well in that movie, and so I was glad to hear that, because I thought, how can I ask him that? I thought that being a photographer was a pretty risky job, as a soldier is, of course, too, but can you talk about that a little bit? Well, of course, and it's a very logical question. Uh, We did suffer, uh, we being combat photographers, uh, were soldiers in the Army like everybody else. I was a corporal on D-Day. We suffered a great deal of casualties because uh, as, uh, as the combat situation developed, we were just constantly transferred from one division to another division. Um, Oftentimes I've asked, well, what division did you belong to? Well, we didn't belong to any. We were transferred constantly wherever the action was. One division went off the line in the reserves, we'd replace them uh, with a new gaining division. So we had a lot of casualties in the company per capita, far more than the average rifle company, because after all, they were picking up a rifle and we were picking up our camera. And you were in the, again getting German fire behind you. They saw you immediately, I'm sure, when you oh. came on shore, even though it was night, it was dark. It was almost dark. It was yeah. almost daylight. And then maybe friendly fire <coughs> from naval ships uh, too, although that probably was rare. How did you protect yourself from German fire when you're supposed to take photographs? Well, y- you you don't. You just uh, ask God before you go in there, how about, can can I stick around for, till tomorrow? <laughs> and uh, the artillery fire from the ships uh, with the fuselage was just incredible. And that went over our heads, of course, because they were trying to hit the bunkers. And uh, the rest of us, we were no different than anybody else. You get on the sand, you uh, try to f- get through the s- surf and get to protection of uh, some banks or some little hill hillocks or something. And hunker down. Lots of soldiers never made it to shore coming oh. off the landing crafts. Did you took those horrible photographs too, and, and uh, the awe and horror of death uh, around you? How did how did you keep your cool? I don't I don't know if we experienced that. Tracy asked me this once before, and I'm asked this constantly. Of course, uh, were you afraid? Did you experience fear? Things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Actually, not as much as you might expect. Uh, for the simple reason that we were all, most all of us were so sick from vomiting, we're, it, we're, anything in the world uh, would be subordinated to getting off that boat because we were so terribly, terribly sick. Which is unfortunate because it, it was delicious eggs and steak. I was going to say the steak dinner. <laughs> Steaks <laughs> and eggs. Uh, well, not really, because if you'll recall <laughs> your history, we went out on June the 5th. Oh, and sure. And Eisenhower kept us on the water overnight because of the bad weather. Sure. So you sat yeah. on the Higgins boats. No, all we're on the larger ships. The LCTs, the landing crafts. Okay. Yeah. Then you know, over the next morning. Yeah. That one day that Eisenhower decided we just can't wait, go now. Yeah. Let's wait until the sixth instead of the fifth. <clears throat> I just can't imagine. You must have been going out of your minds because you've got your adrenaline all ready to go, don't you? And then when they say stand down, twenty-four hours, I just 
can't imagine what that must have done to your heart. Well, you're right. You're absolutely correct, Tracy. Uh, it was a tremendous psychological impact. I don't know if it was a letdown or a buoyancy. I, I'm not sure which. Probably both. Yeah, I think so. But I do recall vividly that the the chaplains, God bless them, and nobody cared if they were a Protestant or a Catholic or Jewish, uh, really stepped up to the plate and talked to us uh, that night. Uh, that was great. There were all kinds of religious services going on. And... Uh, You've heard the expression, there are no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> we weren't in foxholes yet, but there were no atheists on that in. ship either. Did you uh, go inland with the troops, and for how long were you at the D-Day uh, scene? Well, Tom, we, of course, got off the beach as quickly as we could and, uh, and m- just moved forward along with the advancing infantry when they came in. And then by the third day, I think it was, my jeep and driver got there. And we had a prearranged point to meet them if, if we could do so. And then uh, we left that particular division and went to another one. Uh, I landed uh, with the engineers, which are part of the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One. And I was pleased to see just a few few weeks ago when I was in France, the uh, our organization is engraved right on that giant mm. pedestal that we are in there. So uh, then we just moved over with the 29th Infantry Division that uh, took St. Lowe. What so did they kept you, you on the front lines pretty much. The oh, we were on the front lines all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What did you have to, w- Jim included in his letter that y- when you were dropped off on the beach, you had carrier pigeons with you, that <laughs> some of them did not survive that landing. <laughs> but why did you have carrier pigeons with you? Uh, that's a fair question, Tracy. Uh, the night before we left France, or I, I mean England, rather, some uh, whiz kids from London came down to see us, and they had... Uh, uh, braces of pigeons with them, and uh, some small 35 millimeter candid cameras and so forth, all unbeknownst to us, and said, uh, take this little still camera with you, along with your movie camera, take pictures of opportunity, put them in this little harness that they had made, and uh, loft the pigeons with, to bring the film back to London. The pigeons had been lofted out of London, and they'd been trained for months, so they knew where to go. Hmm. And so we had a little cage uh, hmm. on our backpack with two pigeons in it, and uh, you may not have noticed, but I'm not the tallest human being in the world. Well, I have to say that in his letter, Jim Jim said that you were an untall person. Uh, an untall person. <laughs> <laughs> or, That's what he called you. Or horizontally or vertically challenged. Vertically challenged, sure. So anyway, uh, floundering around in the deep water and all that with a heavy pack, all the equipment that we had, cameras, some film, pigeons. gun, roll, everything under the sun. We had a lot of weight. Uh, by the time I crawled out of it, one of the pigeons had drowned which I didn't know about. Of course, I couldn't see them, but some soldier beside me started to laugh hysterically, <laughs> and guns are going off and artillery and everything under the sun, and I I think pigeon. I said something about, I, I'm not sure what's funny. She said, well, you got a dead pigeon on your back. <laughs> well, you know, the, the landing craft itself was dangerous to get on shore. Some oh, stopped too yeah. short of shore and oh, people yeah. drowned. You had heavy yeah. equipment on yeah. you. Yeah. Others went in. Uh, tanks. I heard they had amphibious tanks that sank. How, how how tough was it to get to shore with the equipment on? Where did you get dropped when that front uh, well, section went down into the water? Well, Tom, as I mentioned earlier, we went in with the engineers, which is a few minutes ahead of the infantry. And so the, the, they dropped the, the, uh, the ramp, of course. How far? Oh, I suppose 20, 30 yards. Not all that far. But there was a lot of water there, and it's... Uh, some holes and things of that nature, and we just ran, ran as fast as good, and got into the protection of some higher ground, that was, and just right. laid down in there and started shooting pictures. And uh, the infantry, when they came, really had it tougher than we did because by this time the Germans uh, had uh, awoken. They fig- started they, to figure it out. That's right, Tracy. They said, "We've this is, looks like it's going to be a bad day." And they were there had been there. a lot of deceptions trying to confuse them and throw them off of the... And I, I've been watching... I, I like to watch a and and History Channel anyway, but I've been watching, especially this week, because they've been having all these D-Day programs on the History Channel, and that <clears throat> it, it said on this program that the Germans really did not think that you would be coming to that beach because where are you going to land everything? There's no, there was no harbor. So oh, they, right. they discounted any <coughs> possibility, really, that you would be landing at the Normandy Beach and Omaha and Juneau and all those. So how long do you think it was? I mean, what was your sense that they figured out, wait a minute, what is this is going to happen right here? Oh, I, and plus we also went in at low tide sure. that they hadn't uh, thought about. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think they recognized it uh, instantly because mm-hmm. uh, this gentleman that I just came back from Europe, on the documentary film, the mm-hmm. f- my adversary, this German, yep. told me that uh, <coughs> he looked out 
and he said there was just ships from horizon to horizon and uh, it was just a shock they, they couldn't even believe what they were seeing they out there. See. how for you how far were you from the port of Cherbourg I know that was one strategic place because they had to have a port and had to mm. unload supplies were you in that area no Tom Cherbourg was uh, a long ways from where we pr- we were you were really but isolated one of my colleagues a photographer went in with the 82nd Airborne he jumped and was captured by the Germans right off the bat. And uh, he was hospitalized in Cherbourg, and we found him when Cherbourg was fallen, and oh. he re-entered our ranks again. But um, I don't know if I answered your question, uh, Tracy, but <laughs> I, I'm sure that they recognized quickly. Very quickly. But it wasn't the key, is that they didn't have their armor positioned in the right place. <laughs> That's and that right. With the delay. Yeah, and history tells us that um, they couldn't wake Hitler up to get him to release the authority. And Rommel was gone at his wife's birthday yeah, party. At his wife's birthday party, that's correct. I bet that his 200-mile drive back to the front was a long drive. Can you imagine what went through his mind? No. Can you imagine? I thought I could steal home for a few days for my wife's birthday. And yeah. And, and, and how many, how much the Germans thought Norway was the where they were going, mm-hmm. which never anything ever mm-hmm. happened there. And there was 400,000, I think I saw, troops yeah. in Norway waiting for the attack there. Which never, ever came to pass. And deceptions, too. Like General Patton had a unit in Britain, what, uh, structured to make the Germans think the attack was going to come at another angle, at another geography. All these things, these deceptions that were mentioned. Well, his unit was actually in England, and they set up dummy uh, inflatable tanks tanks and things. They could blow over in the wind. But the main thing was they generated immense amount of radio traffic to convince the Germans that... uh, that uh, that's that would be jo- Uncle George that would come in. <laughs> when when I saw the movie Saving Private Ryan, mm-hmm. which you have said the beginning of that film is extremely accurate, the rest of the film not so much. And I think the beginning of that film, the first eighteen minutes, is what just captures you and stays with me. Has stayed with me as much I'm sure I the actual thing stayed it, with yeah. you. So yeah. I think that m- my question is when I saw that film, I thought. How in the world did those guys get off those Higgins boats? I mean, what? They knew that they were sitting ducks, and the averages were that they probably weren't going to make it to the beach. And so I think it's just my mind that had never had to even consider such a sacrifice, putting in the mind of those young soldiers. But I I think that I, until just this week, I've always thought, how did they find it in them? I think they would be so scared that they couldn't even go. But I think from my conversations with you and from thinking about it this week, that time where I think all of a sudden you go, I've got to go now, actually came before. It wasn't when the door came up on the Higgins boats and the guys had to hit the water or you had to hit the water with your equipment. It was Was it before that? Or when is it when you had your moment that you, you say, you're not the only person I've heard say, I wasn't afraid because that was later mm-hmm. and it was earlier but at that time there was no there was really wasn't any fear so when was that switch turned for you it's just too much for me well i, I think we were like coiled springs uh, the closer we got to the beach the more uh, excited or not excited i guess the more aware mm-hmm. we were of the task ahead of us which was to bolt out of this boat the instant the ramp land i'm out of here mm-hmm. and if any guy was hesitated in front he got knocked into the water it's like a paratrooper that doesn't jump Somebody mm-hmm. behind him pushes him out mm-hmm. the side of the aircraft. And the other thing that was so terrible, but we didn't have a chance yet to see too much of it, was uh, we were instructed never, ever, ever pause to try to help a guy that gets hit and is knocked on. Uh, because then you bunch up in the boat. Sure. And then become a huge target. Mm-hmm. And if some fellow has the misfortune uh, of, uh, of falling or getting shot or whatever the case may be, you saw it in private, Ryan. Mm-hmm. You, have to just, you have to just grit your teeth and charge. You and your friend go. goes down and you keep going. You keep and going. And don't even bat an eyelash. You can't. Is that, was it, was, it was that accurate oh, in absolutely. the film? Oh, abs- absolutely. No, you, you, you absolutely wouldn't dream of stopping because the, uh, the Germans had the advantage of all of the uh, pre-sighting of their weapons. When was your first contact with enemy troops? What Germans did you see first and take pictures of? What was that circumstance? Uh, Tom, the first one I saw actually was right on the beach and he was dead. And I think I told Tracy the other day, it was more a feeling of curiosity. Uh, I saw this human being laying there, and I walked up and looked at him. And you, after all of these years of basic training and photo ID and things of that nature, by golly, this uniform is just like the pictures had. And look at here. And, uh, just like they taught you. Gee, just like they taught us. Gosh, look at his shoes. I'll be doggone. And his rifle, he's got a Mauser 
well, just like we've been told. So it wasn't a shock at seeing a dead person as much as it was curiosity. It really was there. Yeah. Our guest is Walter Halloran, and he is a Chatfield native. He has spent his a good chunk of his life in the military, and he was there on the beach at Normandy, and we've made it halfway through the show, Walter, and I'm really glad you haven't left yet. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. No, no, not yet. I still have a few questions. I have a few, just I'm, a few. I was afraid you might. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I'm. It's 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 been pretty painless so far. I hope. Yes, you're doing very well. Your probably yeah. job is secure. Oh, good. It's ten twenty eight. We'll be back. We need to talk a little bit about this television special that you are a part of, which is what brought you to my attention and the German soldier that you met because of this television special. So we'll we'll get to that. Our guest, Walter Halloran, um, on the Tracy McRae Show. I still have a few questions. I have a few, just I'm, a few. I was afraid you might. <clears throat> yeah, I know. I'm, it's, it's, it's been pretty painless so far, I hope. Yes, you're doing very well. Your probably yeah. job is secure. Oh, good. It's 1028. We'll be back. We need to talk a little bit about this television special that you are a part of, which is what brought you to my attention and the German soldier that you met because of this television special. So we'll, we'll get to that. Our guest, Walter Allen. News Talk 1340, KROC AM. This is the Tracy McRae Show with Andy Brownell and Tom Ostrom and our special guest, Walter Halloran, talking about his recollections of 60 years ago. He was on the beach at Normandy. And which beach were you at specifically? Omaha. You were at Omaha, which was the worst of all of the beaches. I believe that's been established. All right. Um, See, I learned a little bit over the last few years about I went to the D-Day Museum in New Orleans which I'll recommend once again to listeners if you ever are there probably you didn't go to New Orleans for the D-Day Museum you went for Bourbon Street but (laughs) give yourself a break and go and check out the D-Day Museum because it's just captured my attention ever since and now when I think Walter about all the photos and and movies that I saw when I was at the museum and just in the last few weeks leading up to this anniversary this weekend, all of the pictures and stuff I've seen on TV and the History Channel, I think, I wonder, it makes me think, no, I wonder if Walter took that. I wonder if that's some of his. Did you just take still photos or did no, you, no. you took real? I was real? not a still photographer. I was a motion picture cameraman. But so we do you were recognize your shots? Oh, sure. I see them all the time. Uh, not all the time. Frequently. Mm-hmm. I'll see a sequence that I know is mine. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, you were part of a six a sixtieth anniversary television show that some French documentarians came to Chatfield, came here, and spent a few days with you. Then then you went to France and you spent a few days with them there as well. And they had chosen you out of all of the American soldiers <laughs> that could have been chosen. They chose you. Isn't that amazing? Which, do you have any idea how they chose you? Charm my head, <laughs> thick head of, of hair. Of course. Okay, and then they chose a German soldier yeah. who they told his story was also part of this television special that is running right now in France. Have you gotten a copy of it? No, it will be aired uh, on June the 6th. It will be. For the first time okay. in France, yes. All right, and so what was that? what was that situation like going back to France and then meeting up with this German man and being part of this 60-year television program. It was very interesting. I didn't know how I would react uh, meeting a German soldier, but uh, he was 19 on DD, as was I, so obviously we were the same age. And he a delightful fellow, um, very successful businessman, and with his fractured English and my fractured German, we uh, communicated rather well. And uh, it was just it was very, very nice. We had a lot of reminisce, a lot of visits. We examined the American cemetery in great detail, placed flowers on the graves. Uh, his wife, by the way, bought a huge bouquet of flowers, gave them to me, and suggested that she and her husband, Franz, walk around the cemetery and place graves on American uh, stones. Mm-hmm. And then we went to the German cemetery, which is not too far away. And that was interesting, too, because Franz had uh, a few tears in his eyes. He went to a particular spot where the members of his bunker, uh, many of them were buried. 
uh, he pointed out to uh, the lieutenant's, the German lieutenant's gravesite, and he said he promoted me to corporal huh. the day before he died. How is it that you give up? I would think that. I would think that you would have to have a lifelong hatred for a German soldier. How is it that? Yeah. Do you know what I'm Fair, saying? Of course I do, Tracy. Fair question. We hear it all of the time. And I was a little bit apprehensive uh, going there to meet him. But after a while, a couple of old people like us standing there reminiscing, you begin to realize uh, clearly the futility of warfare, even though it's been going on since mankind and probably all it will. And it finally reduces itself to a common denominator of two old guys that were just doing what their government asked them to do. Uh, and uh, you look at each other and say, well, gosh, you're not a bad sort of a fellow. Hmm. Uh, you've got a wife and a child and so forth. Explain that you brought in a photograph of when, <coughs> you, when you were there and you were standing at the Omaha Beach with Franz and Walt and Franz having a conversation. And all of a sudden you were surrounded by French high school students. Uh, Buslo, yes. We were looking at the, over the precipice down at the beach to p- trying to recall exactly where we were. He was in a bunker, by the way, and I was down below. And uh, we suddenly realized we were surrounded by a whole uh, large group of uh, students from local area. And they asked the usual questions that they, all of these students do. The girls wanted to know, did you get wet or were you cold? And the boys <laughs> wanted to know, how many guys did you shoot? Mm-hmm. But I could tell the questions weren't really uh, particularly searching. So I thought I would try something on, and I said, do you f- young people realize that had Franz and I met 60 years ago today down on the beach, only one of us would have walked away. Mm-hmm. We would have had I, to kill one of the other. I said, he'd have shot me, or I'd have shot him. Well, and, you're and Franz said, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and that <laughs> got their attention. You're a pilot. Uh, you were a pilot in Vietnam, helicopter pilot. You're taking photographs. What always intrigued me about Normandy is these gliders that were uh, dragged over the sea, and then the yeah. ropes loosened, and yeah. in they went, relatively helpless, although yeah. flying, and lots of them crashed, oh, yes. and they didn't know where they were going to land. Did you come across any of those uh, men, those courageous men, or those gliders, uh, and, and the successes and disasters of that method of operation? Oh, yeah. In, first of all, we took lots of photographs of them in England before in their training. But as far as uh, France is concerned, oh, sure, that, that's a subject that we had to photograph. And we went into the areas where the debris was scattered all over, the, and the Germans posted many, What were those many gliders poles. called again? The uh, American version of them. I just saw a thing on it two nights ago, and I can't oh, remember what the, the name the of coffin? them was. coffin? Yes, uh, the flying, flying coffins. coffins. <laughs> because coffin makers were skilled in woodwork. Yes. And they fabricated many of the... Mm. Many of the uh, <laughs> yeah, they were, uh, they were heroic people, really, because they had no chance. They, they just saw what happened. At least the parachutists, mm-hmm. they could control their descent to some degree and so forth. Mm-hmm. But they did a great job. Mm-hmm. They did a great job. Now, Walter, mm-hmm. after you got inland yeah. and you began to actually run into the French people, that must have been quite of an experience to see their, their gratitude when you actually ran into the French. Well, of course it was. The The old French people had tears in their eyes, and the just to be liberated was more than they could even comprehend. The little children wanted chewing gum and candy, <laughs> like wonderful children all over the world, like Olivia or anybody else. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but the, the proponents of the people, of course, and particularly the clergy, uh, most of that country in Normandy is Catholic, and all of these wonderful old priests would come out just uh, almost speechless in gratitude. And I guess more importantly, recognition of the fact this terrible thing is over. We are now going to be free people once more. So their gratitude was just, as you might imagine, absolutely overwhelming. And when I was there a couple of months ago, at least up in Normandy area, it might be applicable in Paris, but up in the Normandy area, they still are so fond of the Americans. They'll do anything for you. And they don't call it the invasion. They call it the liberation. They call it the liberation, Tracy. That's correct. Yeah. So you... uh, you went on to serve in Korea. You went on to serve in Vietnam, as you have said. How long were you in? F- how long were you in France? You mean during the war? Yes. Well, I uh, landed on June the sixth, as you know, and mm-hmm. VE Day was May the eighth. Mm-hmm. Of course, we were over in France. How long we were there, I don't recall. We just moved with the army as they went along. The biggest breakthrough was the Battle of Saint Lô to break through that, and Paris fell on uh, my birthday, August twenty fifth. I remember that. Mm. And then wherever we crossed the Remagen Bridge on into Germany, I guess, Tracy, I don't recall how many weeks or months we were in. Whatever it took, you'd have to go to your history books 
for the army to get across France. How is it that then did you decide to make the to make this a career because you were started off as a photographer in World War II, but then you wound up continuing on your career in the Korean War and the Vietnam War. I don't know. It it just happens. I, I can't give you an intelligent <laughs> answer. Uh, and you became a pilot. Well, that don't, that story won't take long to tell. Uh, <laughs> part, uh, part of our responsibility was to ride in the back seat of Piper Cubs, which were very prominent in that war. They called them grasshoppers, to photograph the towns as they were captured and things of that nature, and battles. And we'd go up sometimes and take pictures to see if we could photograph German artillery batteries firing. With you'd see the flash of their guns. Mm-hmm. And uh, they s- soon discovered that sometimes when the pilots were shot or killed, they were all flying sergeants in those days, uh, the photographer would get killed too. So they thought it might be a good idea to teach the photographers how to fly an airplane. Sure. And that was the reason, and that's how that so came So you were bad. not a photographer in Korea? Yes, in I was, but I was oh, an were. officer by this time, and I commanded a photographic organization. Mm-hmm. You know, having been in the service myself, and you were, you were very modest, you hesitate to to put a positive slant about your own talent <laughs> in your escalation in your career. But I know that you worked your way up from enlisted to officer and got a battlefield commission. And I would think, having been in the service, that gave that that you'd gone through the ranks and knew other people's jobs gave you a lot of credibility with enlisted people, even though you were an, when you and you were an officer. Is it? You're absolutely correct, Tom. It, it really did. It made my job, I think, quite a bit easier. That is, jobs where I was uh, with troops. If I was in staff jobs, I was a general staff officer in the Pentagon for a while and also in, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense as a general staff officer. So you're not, you're not working with the uh, troops in, in those capacities. But each time I went back to into the, as we used to say, went back to the Army again, <laughs> uh, those things did help a great deal. Because I walk guard and pull KP and so forth like all the grunts. But an enlisted man who knew your ladder if I understood the story correctly, uh, tried to get a little edge in association <laughs> with you. And how did you, and we can hear how eloquent you are, how did you handle that one? <laughs> oh, on my first day in Vietnam, uh, in things quieted down in the evening, and the sergeant major came in, he wanted to talk to me. And he said that uh, we've gone through your personnel files, and we see now that you were a former enlisted man, a former NCO, so you're one of us, aren't you? And I says, no, Sergeant, I'm not one of you. <laughs> <laughs> and that is With a smile, with that, that smile, well, I can see. Yeah. And that establishes the rules yeah. of the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I have been curious mm-hmm. about is you hear that the World War II generation was the greatest generation and how the whole country rallied and the women, you know, Rosie Riveter went off to work and the family sacrificed and the soldiers went and everyone did it because they understood what they were fighting for. And it was this, you get the feeling from the stories that it was just the whole country galvanized behind this effort and not just the whole country, a good chunk of the whole world was galvanized behind this effort. And so then I, he- you know, I hear a story of what it was like to send the soldiers to Vietnam, where the country is divided, and when it is to send these soldiers to Iraq, where the country is divided. And I wonder, is it just that it's so far in the hindsight of 2020, was the country divided during that time of World War II? Was the country divided into sending all you guys? Was it different than it has been in my lifetime, Vietnam and then all the Iraq soldiers? Uh, good points. Very valid points, uh, Tracy. I'm glad you mentioned them. No, in World War II, there's unanimity there. That there, It was just fantastic. In fact, a draft age young man walking on the streets of Rochester in civilian clothes would probably be challenged by some of the people who want to know why you aren't doing your thing. And I know when I came back from World War II, I landed in Rochester at the railroad station. And after greeting my parents, some dignified, well-dressed elderly gentleman walked up to me, total stranger, I don't know who he was, and he said, uh, congratulations, Sergeant. We're glad you're home, and thank you for the job you did. Mm -hmm. Words to that effect. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what puzzles me, though, because before World War II, there was great division. Even Minnesota's famous uh, reserve Colonel Lindbergh was against the war. (laughs) Lots of people were. They hated Franklin Roosevelt for trying to prepare us for war. And then when Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, that galvanized the nation and and unity. So I'm kind of surprised in Iraq that 9-11 hasn't galvanized a, a more uh, mm. uh, rigorous unity than it has. 
Well, I, I, I don't know. I think there's so much controversy, so much, uh, such a divergence of viewpoints on the Iraq situation, all the way from these kids taking these photographs to, to the rest of it. it. It's a terrible dilemma. But to expand a little bit on what you started off on, uh, coming back from the Korean War, uh, it seemed to be most of my friends who met me seemed to be rather indifferent and basically said, well, what, what, what are you doing over there for? I love mm-hmm. Korea. But when I came back in the Vietnam War, there was open hostility everywhere. There was. Particularly if you were in a wearing uniform. Sure. Oh, it was terrible, as you well know. Everybody knows that. And Iraq 1, though, got yeah. the public to appreciate the service mm-hmm. again. Iraq 2, as you're all saying, uh, has divisiveness. I, you know, I wonder if we, Tracy and I, grew up a life of privilege. I, I mean, I... Compared to your generation coming out of the Depression and then yeah. directly into global conflict. Privilege. I mean, clueless privilege. Well, I know, privilege. but you, you can't escape the fact that we're spo- <laughs> we were spoiled rotten, and even my children, it's even worse. And maybe that has something to do with it, that you folks had your entire generation from the new hardship. Grew up oh, yes. through hardship. We really never I've knew never it. I've never known it, yeah. And, and yet... Actually, we grew up on a farm in Chatfield, poor Irish, good Irish family, <laughs> Irish nobility. And uh, we didn't know that we were poor because mm-hmm. we had food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, we remember we were permitted to go barefoot in the summer. Mother didn't have to buy a pair of shoes. Uh, and I don't suppose my father had $1,000 at one time in his entire life. But we didn't know that we yeah. were poor because everybody, our playmates, we're all in exactly the same category. It's 1049 on the Tracy McRae Show. Walter Halloran is having a conversation with us about his part in the 60th anniversary of the invasion or liberation of Normandy, depending on your geography on that one. We'll take our final break, and we'll be back to the Tracy McRae Show on KROC. Sergeant Major came in. He wanted to talk to me. And he said that uh, we've gone through your personnel files, and we see now that you were a former enlisted man and former NCO, so you're one of us, aren't you? And I says, no, Sergeant, I'm not one of you. <laughs> <laughs> and that is With a smile, with that, that smile, well, I can see. Yeah. And that establishes the rules yeah. of the... <laughs> sure. yeah. One of the things that I have been curious mm. about is you hear that... The World War II generation was the greatest generation and how the whole country rallied and the women, you know, Rosie Riveter went off to work and the family sacrificed and the soldiers went and everyone did it because they understood what they were fighting for. And it was this, you get the feeling from the stories that it was just the whole country galvanized behind this effort and not just the whole country. A good chunk of the whole world was galvanized behind this effort. And so then I, you know, I hear a story of what it was like to send the soldiers to Vietnam, where the country is divided, and when it is to send these soldiers to Iraq, where the country is divided. And I wonder, is it just that it's so far in the hindsight of 2020, was the country divided during that time of World War II? Was the country divided into sending all you guys? Was it different than it has been in my lifetime, Vietnam and then all the Iraq soldiers? Uh, good points. Very valid points, uh, Tracy. I'm glad you mentioned them. No, in World War II, there was unanimity there. That there, It was just fantastic. In fact, a draft age young man walking on the streets of Rochester in civilian clothes would probably be challenged by some of the people who want to know why you aren't doing your thing. And I know when I came back from World War II, I landed in Rochester at the railroad station. And after greeting my parents, some w- dignified, well-dressed elderly gentleman walked up to me, total stranger, I don't know who he was. And he said, uh, congratulations, Sergeant. We're glad you're home, and thank you for the job you did. Mm-hmm. Words to that effect. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what puzzles me, though, because before World War II, there was great division. Even Minnesota's famous uh, reserve Colonel Lindbergh was against the war. <laughs> yeah. Lots of people were. They hated Franklin Roosevelt for trying yeah. to prepare us for war. And then when Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, that g- galvanized sure. the nation and, and that. unity. So I'm kind of surprised in Iraq that 9-11 hasn't galvanized a, a more uh, uh, rigorous unity than it has. Well, I, I, I don't know. I think there's so much controversy, so much, uh, such a divergence of viewpoints on the Iraq situation, all the way from these kids taking these photographs to, to the rest of it. it. It's a terrible dilemma. But to expand a little bit on what you started off on, uh, coming back from the Korean War, uh, it seemed to be most of my friends who met me seemed to be rather indifferent and basically said, well, what, what, what are you doing over there for? I love to go to Korea. 
But when I came back in the Vietnam War, there was open hostility everywhere. There was. Particularly if you were in a wearing uniform. Sure. Oh, it was terrible, as you well know. Everybody knows that. And Iraq 1, though, got yeah. the public to appreciate the mm-hmm. service again. Iraq 2, as you're all saying, uh, has divisiveness. I, you know, I wonder if we, Tracy and I, grew up a life of privilege. I, I mean, I compared to your generation coming out of the Depression and then yeah. directly into global conflict... Privilege, I mean, clueless privilege. Well, I know, privilege. but you, you can't escape the fact that we're spo- <laughs> we were spoiled rotten, and even my children, they're, it's even worse. And maybe that has something to do with it. That you folks had your entire generation from the new hardship grew up oh, yes. through hardship. We really never Have knew never it. Never known it. Yeah. And and yet, actually, we grew up on a farm in Chatfield. Poor Irish, good Irish family, <laughs> an Irish nobility. And uh, we didn't know that we were poor because mm-hmm. we had food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, we remember we were permitted to go barefoot in the summer. Mother didn't have to buy a pair of shoes. Uh, and I don't suppose my father had $1,000 at one time in his entire life. But we didn't know that we yeah. were poor because everybody, our playmates, we're all in exactly the same category. It's 1049 on the Tracy McRae Show. Walter Halloran is having a conversation with us about his part in the 60th anniversary of the invasion or liberation of Normandy, depending on your geography on that one. We'll take our final break, and we'll be back to the Tracy McRae Show on KROC. Tracy and I grew up a life of privilege. I, I mean, I compared to your generation... Coming out of the depression and then yeah. directly into global conflict, privilege, I mean, clueless privilege. Well, I know, privilege. but you, you can't escape the fact that we're spo- <laughs> we were spoiled rotten, and even my children, they're, it's even worse. And maybe that has something to do with it. That you folks had your entire generation from the new hardship grew up oh, yes. through hardship. We really never Have knew. Never it. known it. Yeah, and and yet. Actually, we grew up on a farm in Chatfield, poor Irish, good Irish family, an <laughs> Irish nobility. And uh, we didn't know that we were poor because mm-hmm. we had food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, we remember we were permitted to go barefoot in the summer. Mother didn't have to buy a pair of shoes. Uh, and I don't suppose my father had $1,000 at one time in his entire life. But we didn't know that we yeah. were poor because everybody, our playmates, we're all in exactly the same category. It's 1049 on the Tracy McRae Show. Walter Halloran is having a conversation with us about his part in the 60th anniversary of the invasion or liberation of Normandy, depending on your geography on that one. We'll take our final break, and we'll be back to the Tracy McRae Show on KROC. Know that we were poor because everybody, our playmates, we're all in exactly the same category. It's 1049 on the Tracy McRae Show. Walter Halloran is having a conversation with us about his part in the 60th anniversary of the invasion or liberation of Normandy, depending on your geography on that one. We'll take our final break, and we'll be back to the Tracy McRae Show on KROC. Geography on that one. We'll take our final break, and we'll be back to the Tracy McRae Show on KROC. Have you been to Washington, D.C. to see the memorial there? You mean the, the new one? Yes, the oh, new no, one. Oh, no, no. I'll wait until this fall when all the kids are back from school. <laughs> things like that. Well, that's what you said you didn't want to go to Normandy this weekend because you said it's going to be a circus and you didn't want to be oh. around any of it. I noticed Tom Brokaw has a place to sleep. Of course. He's got mm-hmm. transportation. You should have bunked with him. I know, I know. <laughs> Tom, what did you have that you well, wanted Steve to mention? Steve Skogan gave me this copy of oh, Henry Hyde's... Uh, Henry Hyde, Congressman Henry Hyde's commemoration of World War II veterans, and this says it all for Walt and his colleagues in arms uh, at Normandy. This 60-year celebration, uh, Representative Hyde said, our lives were irrevocably changed by our experiences during the Second World War as we remember with affection and awe and gratitude those in whom the bright promise of youth was cut short Mm -hmm. by the ultimate sacrifice. We remember that freedom has a high price. We owe an unpayable debt to the heroes of freedom whose gift of self, embodied in the performance of their duty, now rest in the cemeteries of Normandy. Great. Great. How is it that how how is it to feel that when I see those hundreds and thousands of stars that represent a hundred soldiers for each star how is it that you feel like you made it and they didn't 
I mean, oh, how does that? Yeah. I have no idea why I survived three wars. I have the faintest idea in the world. Only God knows, and he hasn't chosen to tell me. Sometimes you just wonder what it is that who, gets you through. Yeah, who knows? And I will probably slip on a banana peel in Rochester, Minnesota, <laughs> <laughs> and end this glorious career. And you're a pilot, too, and you still like danger and, uh, and the thrill of it. Oh, as a matter of fact, I flew yesterday, and I'm going to fly again this afternoon. You said it's such a nice afternoon. Perfect. What time are we going to get out of here so oh, I can go flying yeah. again? You wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. I guarantee you that if you would be willing, I could keep you here all afternoon. Because after all of the, like I said, I don't know what has captured my attention about it, but I think it is um, my young, privileged, clueless realization a few years ago when I was at that D-Day museum that there was a generation that just gave up, that that offered so much. And I think that... It has been, uh, you know, I had to twist your arm, and I'm glad we've made it to the end of the hour, but I, I f- ran across a quote on the VFW website that was having to do with the roundtable discussions that mm-hmm. you take part in every once in a while in yes. s- up yep. in the Twin Cities, mm-hmm. saying that the the people who pull together, Mr. Patton, mm-hmm. who might have been who you uh, worked with. Don Patton. Don Patton said he needs, you need, he needs to convince people like yourself that what they did was important, and it's important for them to relate and record their experience. And... I think that's what's been so interesting and also challenging for me is how I could convince you that it was important, you know, just to even to me personally to have you as a guest this hour. So I'm very happy that you came in. Well, you're very sweet. <clears throat> the, I have to admit, uh, it was your own dialogue on the radio last week that I was listening to you and Tom and others talking about this. It was on Tuesday, and I said, there's a guy that I can't get to call me yeah. back, and it was you, <laughs> yes. and you were listening. I was in my car, and I thought, oh... Uh, Damn it. She, <laughs> she's probably right. <laughs> I'm so glad that my heart felt plea that you were listening to it. That's very good. You did a job on me. Good. Now before we go, the the one you know, you're talking about generations and our view of history and especially D Day because we know the outcome, obviously. And when I talked to my mother, she would have been fourteen years old at that time and back home obviously. And she said that that outcome certainly wasn't assured and there was it, back here in the United States all everybody's hopes and wishes were with you guys on that day because this was it this was really the mm-hmm. the defining moment of this war against Hitler's forces and maybe your take I mean I got you know the take from back home but as you were preparing for that that uh, did you guys understand how important this next couple days were going to be no, because we were teenagers. We were invulnerable. Nobody's going to hurt us. Time over. He might get shot, or you might get shot, but I'm not going to get shot. Mm. And uh, I, at that age, I was 19 years old. Uh, Eisenhower really didn't ask too many questions from me. Did you ever get to meet him? <laughs> oh, yes. I have an autographed picture of him at home in my, uh, in my uh, room downstairs. I learned this week that he liked to go out and look into the eyes specifically of oh, individual yes. soldiers, and yeah, it helped yeah. him understand. Yeah. So did Patton. Patton was easy to photograph because he was sort of a ham. It's <laughs> funny how <laughs> he was good. Patton was a skilled combat soldier. Ike mm-hmm. hadn't had combat experience, but was a great administrator. All yeah. the talents you officers have to have in the service. Yeah. But Patton was also kind of crazy, wasn't he? Was oh, he <laughs> kind of out know. there? I guess you have to be to be. He's reputed to have been the wealthiest man, uh, general officer mm-hmm. in the Army. Oh, yes. He had a whole they complemented each other well, I guess, is what I'm saying, Patton and Eisenhower. Well, I think there was a lot of friction back and forth, but they, underst- but they understood each other. And uh, he'd have to put Patton on ice periodically and then call him out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to say? I don't think so, except uh, will the check be in the mail later on today? <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll show you a few more pictures of Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> you have a enough. lifetime pass to the studio, Walt. Oh, you can come you at any time you want. Hopefully it'll be cooler yeah. next time. Thank you, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Thank and you, Walt. A pleasure. You can go to lunch with Tom Ostrom and Andy Brownell anytime okay. you want. I'll take you up for an airplane ride. All right, thank you. <laughs>